After years of waiting, Sony's A6700 camera is here. And today I'm gonna to be reviewing this camera from the perspective of a wedding filmmaker. So if you film weddings or documentaries or literally anything else for that matter, this video is for you. I'm also going to spoil the conclusion of this review for you right now because I respect your time and say that the A6700 is small, but it is an absolute powerhouse of a camera packed full of nearly every single video feature you get from Sony's full frame cameras, but in a significantly more affordable package that is also great for photography as well. These features are incredibly impressive, but unfortunately, they're also the camera's downfall with an overheating risk if you are filming outdoors on a hot day in direct sunlight. In short, if you are a brand new hobbyist filmmaker or a hybrid filmmaker and photographer and you have a limited budget, this is still a great camera. But if you want a camera for wedding filmmaking and if you can afford a bit more, the Sony FX30 will provide you with more pro features and reliability like dual SD card slots and a guarantee of no overheating. All right, you gotta watch the rest of this review for more details. So before we dive into it, for the sake of ethics, I want you to know that this video is not paid or sponsored by Sony, but they did loan me this camera early so I can make this review and I have to send it back to them very soon. So how did we get here? Come back with me now to February 2016. Less than six months prior, Sony had released the A7S II, a camera that I absolutely loved and used for five years before finally upgrading to the A7S III. 2016 brought a very interesting camera update though in the form of an APS-C camera named the A6300. Filmmakers and photographers like myself were frankly shocked because Sony had essentially taken all of the video features of their flagship A7S II and crammed them into an APS-C body that could record 4K video for a dramatically cheaper price. And this really sums up Sony's product strategy. And I think that we can see it play out in the exact same way with the A6700 as well. Just like how Sony took all the features of the A7S II and put them into the dramatically more affordable A6300, Sony released a little camera in 2020 that I happen to be filming this video on right now, the A7S III. And now here we are at the A6700, a camera that puts all of those features plus more into a much cheaper APS-C camera. And I'm sure some of you are thinking or typing in the comments, Matt, it's taken Sony three years after the A7S III to make this camera. Whenever they released the A6300 about four months later after the A7S II. And you're right. But I also want you to consider that the A6300 was limited in some of its capabilities. It didn't have certain features like in-body image stabilization. That wouldn't come for eight months later with the A6500. And then Sony also released the A6400, A6600, and A6100, all of which either added or removed features to hit different price points. With the A6700 though, it almost feels like Sony has jumped over all of those other iterations that they've done in the past. It really isn't fair to compare the A6700 to the A6300 because this camera has so many features. Yes, it's taken three years to come out, but in relation, it feels more like the A6600 felt compared to the A7S II, not the A6300. And guess how long it took Sony to release the A6600? Three years later. See my point with the A6700? Anyways, history lesson out of the way, which you can tell me if that was interesting or not down in the comments below. I thought it was cool. We really need to talk about the features and capabilities of this camera. Starting off, just look at this thing. Yes, it does feel a bit like Sony's earlier APS-C cameras like the A6600, but it is clear that Sony has taken the time to improve basically every single feature. The camera itself is a bit bigger, but as a benefit, that means the grip has been beefed up a bit and it is now much more comfortable to hold. Look, my pinky, my pinky fits on it. That's nice if you use a previous A6000 camera, you know how important well pinky grip is. In addition, after the really sad flip around screen experience of the A6400, which I bought, and then had to purchase an aftermark adapter for to move the microphone mount over so I could see the screen while using a shotgun mic, the A6700 adopts the very popular flip around screen we've seen on the A7S III and also many other newer Sony cameras. Unfortunately, this is not the hybrid flip around, flip up screen that you may have seen on the Sony a7R5, which so many people love, myself included. But regardless, this screen is still a massive upgrade over my a6400, and in my opinion, all of the other Sony a7000 series of cameras too. 
Now, in addition to improving the screen, Sony has also improved the overall layout of the camera as well. They didn't just make the grip larger, they also added a lot more buttons and dials to the camera overall. With my old A6400, it sometimes felt like such a chore to change any camera setting because Sony had stripped back the number of buttons and dials from their full frame cameras. Thankfully, it f appears that Sony has realized this was an ergonomic nightmare, and just like how with their full frame cameras, they've gradually made them incrementally bigger every time they release a new generation, which has only improved ergonomics. I'm so glad to see them applying that to their APS-C line of cameras as well. You have a new dial on the front. There's a dedicated record button now. I think you're gonna be incredibly happy about this. They did keep an old holdover that I had forgotten about from previous Sony cameras though. Look at this little C1 custom button placement. This used to be the video record button on early Sony cameras, and it was such a pain to press because you had to move your thumb in such a weird way and it hurt and I would be sore after filming a wedding for a while. Yeah, I just reprogrammed the button. But now you don't really have to use it. If you want to, you can, because it's just a custom button now. You can use it if you want to or just ignore it and use the big record button on top. Now, as far as things you will not be happy about, on the other hand, once we open up the side panel of this camera, you're going to be a bit more disappointed by what you see. The first thing you notice is that while there is a USB-C input for power and headphone and microphone jacks, plus the hot shoe also accepts Sony's electronic shotgun microphones, by the way, which is awesome, the camera only has a micro HDMI port, which I assume is most likely due to the size of this smaller camera's body overall, but nobody likes micro HDMI. Honestly though, that's not what you're going to be upset about. What you're gonna be upset about is this little slot in the middle of the side panel here. What is that, Matt? Well, if you've ever used one of Sony's older APS-C cameras, you may remember that the SD card slot was actually stored right next to the battery. It was kind of a pain to access because anytime you wanted to swap your memory card, you'd have to open up the battery door and if your camera was mounted to a gimbal or tripod, etc., this would mean you may have to dismount your entire camera setup just to swap a memory card and this was a big pain. Thankfully, Sony has fixed that issue. No SD card here. They've moved the SD card input to the side of the camera right next to all the other inputs and outputs, so it's very easily accessible. But I did say that you were going to be unhappy, and I'm sure you've probably guessed why just by looking at this thing, but if you aren't sure, I'll just spell it out for you. The A6700, for all of its improvements and features over its predecessors, only has one SD card slot. Yes, you can cry now if you need to. I know that I did when I first discovered this. Sony was so close. For weddings and other professional filmmaking, I really try to recommend cameras that have dual memory card slots for backup recording because this is one less area where your recording could fail. But that said, I kind of get it. None of Sony's previous cameras in the A6000 line have had dual SD card slots, so it's not a total surprise that they wouldn't include them in the A6700. Plus, for my first decade of filming weddings with Canon and Sony cameras, none of them had dual memory card slots and I never had an unrecoverable card failure. So I would not necessarily let this camera's single SD card slot prevent you from buying this camera for professional work. Now the overheating on the other hand, that may keep you from buying it, more on that in a little bit. Anyways, all that said about the single SD card slot, Sony does have an alternative option for you. If you are willing to spend a bit more, they have a little camera called the FX30, and that camera does come with dual SD card slots and does support simultaneous recording to both of them. So if you're really worried about dual memory card slots, I would spend a bit more money and get that camera. Speaking of the FX30, by the way, the A6700 unsurprisingly has a ton of similarities with that camera. And what may actually end up surprising you, because it's surprised me is that both of these cameras share essentially the same sensor. And we gotta talk about that sensor and what it can do because it's really impressive and it is a massive leap over previous A6000 cameras. To start from a video recording standpoint, this camera is a powerhouse. You can record 4K at up to 120 frames per second, which does come with a 1.35 times crop, but you can also record in 4K 60 with no crop and 1080p HD at up to 240 frames per second. It does all of this in 422 10-bit, just like you would get with any of Sony's full-frame cameras, which means that yes, this camera will match up extremely well with them. 
For an APS-C camera, it's also quite good in low light, and just like the FX30, it appears to have the same dual native ISOs at 800 and 2500, and I would feel comfortable cranking that ISO up much higher, especially if you were using prime lenses that are f1.4 or f1.8, etc. Of course, the a6700 also includes all of Sony's picture profiles like S-Log3 and S-Cinetone, which is great, but there is unfortunately no Cine EI mode, as it appears that Sony has decided to keep that mode for their FX line of cameras. So you're going to need to get the FX30 if you want that option. Incidentally, if you don't know what Cine EI mode is and you're interested in learning more about it, I have an explainer video that will show you everything you need to know about how to film in Cine EI mode, and I'll link to that video up in the corner and down in the video description. Now, interestingly though, while I said that this camera does not have Cine EI mode, one feature that it pulls from the FX line of cameras is that you can add a custom LUT to your footage preview in camera. This is awesome, and I love to see it. Also, this is yet another review of a Sony camera where I tell you the good news that Sony has added all of their latest camera software features to this new camera as well. While people like me continue to complain that cameras like the a7S III keep getting left behind when it comes to new software features, with cameras like the a6700, Sony is making sure that all of their previously announced software features come to this camera. So you are getting things like focus breathing compensation and a focus map. But even more than that, you also get new features that Sony introduced in their more recent cameras like the ZV-E1. So you can do cool things like put this camera on a tripod and it will automatically zoom in post and make sure you stay in the frame. It's pretty cool. Not to mention, this camera also includes Sony's artificial intelligence chip that we first saw on the a7R5. So it's gonna be incredibly accurate when it comes to autofocus. And that's awesome. And now we need to take a second and go back to that comparison between this a6700 and the FX30, because while they are very similar, there are two big differences. The first is those dual memory card slots on the FX30, but the other is very important too, and that is that the FX30 has a fan, which will essentially guarantee that it never overheats. Looking at this A6700 now, um, there's no fan slot anywhere. And if you think back to Sony's older A6000 line, specifically the A6300 and A6500, those cameras were notorious for overheating. So how do you think that the A6700 fares in regards to overheating? Well, in my testing, which thankfully we are right at the start of summer here in Texas where it is brutally hot and temperatures on average are starting to get close to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So I was able to test this and boy, what a test it was. I put the A6700 outdoors in direct sunlight while it was 92 degrees outside with the auto power off temperature set to high, the screen pulled out and the camera itself set to record in 4K 60 frames per second in XAVC HS. I was prepared to stand outside in the heat and babysit this camera for a while, but unfortunately I did not have to wait long with the camera overheating and shutting down in 10 minutes and 25 seconds. Bummer. I then took the camera inside to cool off before testing it again with the same settings, just recording in 24 frames per second instead of 60 to see if it performed better. Unfortunately, performance was not very improved with the camera only lasting for 13 minutes and 35 seconds. Of course, I also tested the camera indoors as well with all the same settings in my studio with the air conditioning set to 72 degrees. And with those settings, the A6700 recorded in 4K60 for 14 minutes and 24 seconds before shutting down, which was not a massive improvement over the outdoors, surprisingly. Thankfully, after letting the camera cool and setting it to record in 4K at 24 FPS, still in that 72 degree room, the A6700 went on to record for about an hour and 59 minutes before the battery died without ever overheating. So what can we learn from this other than me almost getting sunburned? Well, first of all, let me just say that I am really impressed by the Sony a7S III. That camera doesn't have a fan either, and Sony somehow made it able to withstand temperatures even hotter than I tested the a6700 with, without overheating even in 4K60. It's just an awesome camera. You gotta watch my overheating test for the a7S III, I'll link to it in the corner in the description if you haven't seen it. It's like the surface of the sun. Anyways, the a6700 on the other hand is significantly less impressive than the a7S III in regards to overheating, and it's really hard hard for me to recommend that you use it to film weddings due to the risk of your camera shutting down mid-recording. If you live in a cooler climate and you only film wedding ceremonies in 4K at 24 FPS, you may be all right. But if you're someone that films in 60 FPS a lot, this may be an issue. 
So if you film weddings in a hot climate like me and you commonly find yourself filming outdoors, that is another argument for you to heavily consider the extra cost of the FX30 over the A6700 because you should never have to deal with overheating with the FX30 thanks to its fan. Speaking of extra costs, this is where we need to talk about the pricing of the A6700 because I'm actually incredibly impressed by the price point that Sony was able to hit with this camera. Sony has told me that the A6700 is gonna be retailing for a price of $1,400, which I was frankly shocked by. Remember how I said at the start of this video that Sony has followed a predictable trend when developing their cameras where they release a high-end, expensive, full-frame version of a camera, then follow that release with a dramatically more affordable APS-C model? That's exactly what they've done here. And what's more impressive is that even with inflation, Sony has hit this price. Because remember, when the A6600 first came out, it cost $1,400 and that camera has way less capability. So it's kind of crazy that here we are four years after that camera came out and we're seeing a major successor to that camera release it virtually the same price. So the price for the A6700 is really impressive, but should you buy it? Well, like I said at the start of this video, if you are a brand new hobbyist filmmaker or a hybrid filmmaker that shoots photo or you have a limited budget for a new camera, I think the A6700 is a great choice. You get an insanely large amount of features that you would normally have to buy one of Sony's much more expensive full-frame cameras to get. Plus, you get the exact same video quality as those more expensive cameras, all for a very affordable price. That said though, the specter of overheating rears its head again with a Sony camera. And if you want to use this camera to film weddings where you need to record ceremonies outdoor in higher temperatures for longer periods, and you can't have your camera fail, plus if you want a less stressful filmmaking experience that comes from a camera that will never overheat and has dual memory card slots, in that case, I would recommend the FX30 over the A6700. That camera will give you many of the same features as this camera, but in a safer body. I'll be sure to link to my FX30 review down below and up in the corner if you want to watch that. And I'll also link to my color presets, who is Matt Lutz, that I've used to color all of the footage that you see in this video and which will enable you to get amazing colors in your videos, regardless of whether you are filming with a Sony camera or any other camera for that matter. I'll also throw a link down there to my YouTube tips for wedding filmmakers guide. This guide is gonna show you how to get more views, likes, and bookings for your wedding films on YouTube. So if you are a wedding filmmaker, check it out. Thanks so much for watching. Please like this video if you enjoyed it, subscribe if you want to see more, and have a great day.